Hello, everyone, and welcome. Can you hear us? Can you write a message if you can hear us well? Can you hear us? Hello, yes, we hear you. Okay, good, good, good. I'm unmuting. Uh, yes, I can hear you. Okay. You can unmute you, maybe, also. Okay, hi everyone. I hope you can hear us. I can hear you. Yes. I hear some words. Yeah? Yes, here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, welcome to our webinar, our campaign. I'm Natasha. I'm here with Ines, my colleague. We will give you um, uh, a little overview on, on the use of EU funds for the transition from institutional to community-based care in the frame of our campaign, EU Funds for Our Rights. As you are... Um, first, before starting, actually, I will just tell you a couple of technical things. Um, you, I think you see on the dashboard here also hands. If you want to say something, raise your hand. <laughs> but, um, and if you don't hear, you can write also a message or a question. So, um, we're gonna lose it. <laughs> I will, I will give you like a, a short overview of the agenda. I th you can all see the screen. Huh? I share the screen. Yes, you can see the screen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. 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 I will. I will just go through the agenda quickly. So, um, as you are uh, aware, we organized three um, regional events. That was one day and a half. We organized in Brussels, Vilnius, and uh, and Bucharest. And uh, and we wanted also to organize one webinar for everyone who couldn't attend, and who wanted to hear a bit how to be included in the campaign. So um, it will be like a very short version of what we did in three cities, but uh, I hope, you know, that you we will give you some information and it will be uh, useful for you. And also in coming months or weeks, you can always ask us, you know, how to be involved in the campaign and uh, what you can do. So uh, the agenda, we, we planned like first session, the functioning of uh, structural funds, and I will also give a short um, presentation of the campaign. Um, then Ines will uh, give you uh, explanations and opportunities for engagement of civil society organizations. And then the first, the third part is actually for you uh, to, to give us a bit information on how is the situation in our country. If, if you are familiar, you know, if you are not, or if you want to be included in a, in a monitoring and a complaint and monitoring system or implementation of EU funds. We, as it is like, as it, we don't have much time, we thought it's good that you write down the questions and uh, after every session you can ask questions. I hope that will be okay, you know, because it's a bit difficult to interrupt like when we are <laughs> online. And uh, we will also do, you can also present yourself during the third session. Everyone will have a chance to talk. So we don't do the first presentation at the, at the beginning. I hope that's, that's fine. <laughs> um, so I will, I will give you now the, I still see some people are. Okay. Um, I will uh, give you like now introduction. 
So what we were, what okay. we want to say about the EU funds, I think you are already familiar. There are five my, my, uh, main funds um, that's, that are ERDF, ESF, Cohesion Fund, European Agricultural Fund, European Maritime and Fishery Fund. And for us, for the domain where we are working on, the most like interesting and uh, relevant are ERDF and European Social Fund. And just some figures, total of European Structural Investment Fund for this period 2014-2020 is 400 54 billion euros for ESF 87, for ERDF 197, and this is EU uh, contribution. Plus, there is a contribution per member state. We are all now. We are. I, I'm. I'm explaining about this current period, 2014-2020, and uh, for this current period, there is a legal framework that everything is basically set and, and, and done according to these uh, regulations. So there is a common provision regulation, ERDF regulation, and ESF regulation. I didn't list, but in all of these regulations, and especially in um, ERDF and ESF, there is a whole list of provisions that really show how funds should be used for the transition from institutional to a community-based care. And uh, when I said European Social Fund and ERDF are the most relevant, of course, because ESF is the main tool to promote employment and social inclusion and uh, to improve employment opportunities, education, lifelong learning, uh, also to contribute to social inclusion and combating poverty. ERDF comes more when you talk about construction, innovation, research, etc. Um, and these funds, there are many rules, eh? I and mean, it's very, very complex, and uh, I'm, I'm sure you're aware of that, and there is a, and I'm sorry if I'm repeating something that you're already familiar with, uh, there is a, there is a, uh, the management of funds, it's set up, there is a common strategic framework, partnership agreements, operational programs, management of programs, monitoring, annual reporting. Everything is done between the European Commission and the, manage, and the, and the member states, and uh, it should be like it, it, it's done in a shared management. So basically, Commission gives uh, managing powers to to the country that country can manage, but Commission still can influence. And what is very important for us is that all everything from the scratch from the first moment. Everything should be done in a partnership with NGOs. And um, when we talk about authorities for implementation of funds, there is managing authority that is a main authority, who is really has a has an overall responsibility. Then monitoring committees, where uh, that that meets like uh, uh, once or twice a year at least. In some countries, even once a month, like Lithuania. And uh, it's, it's a very formal meeting where all the stakeholders involved in operational program participate. Uh, later you can tell me if some of your organizations participate in monitoring committees. Unfortunately, not many details can be discussed in monitoring committees because it, it is very formal. Huh? Uh, certification body, auditing body, intermediate bodies and beneficiaries, then we come to you if some of you are already using EU funds. I will say about some novelties in this period. It's um, the Commission really wanted to link funding and policy. So uh, European structural funds, investment funds, are, they try to link it closely to policy. So um, all funding should be linked to Europe 2020. And when we talk about Europe 2020 goals, the most, the most interesting, let's say, for us is inclusive growth, where there are thematic objectives from the funds, and the, the, the thematic objective, it is nine, here is two, promoting social inclusion, combating poverty and discrimination. They will try also to, to strengthen this link between funding and policy, and because now they are discussing for post-2020. Who knows what it will be? 
Another novel is Exandre Conditionalities. Um, you might, you are probably also familiar with this novelty. It's a precondition for effective and efficient use of it, of uh, structural funds. And the uh, Commission wanted to, together with member states, to create like preconditions to even before starting using the funds. And really to improve. So, so basically the idea is to improve the effectiveness of, of investment and for example um, ex-ante conditionalities can be thematic or general. Thematic it can be linked really for a specific investment and general it's not linked to a specific investment. Uh, so for us let's say relevant ex-ante conditionalities it's there is a general one on disability but there should be administrative capacity in place for the implementation and application of the UNCRPD, for example, or thematic conditionality for social inclusion, combating poverty and discrimination. Well, this all, this, it looks good on paper, but what we also discovered in discussions with the Commission, with the other organizations, that actually one precondition can be a strategy, but no one checks if that strategy is good. If it's, if it's really concrete and if there is an impact. And we are now discussing it a lot with the Commission because no one has time to check this. So we think it is a good thing to include uh, extended conditionalities but also to ensure that it is checked. Another novelty is European Code of Conduct and Partnership. It's a novelty and the Commission is now also uh, developing, well, working on it to improve it. But this is very important for the civil society sector because it really, it, it, it really gives provisions that civil society needs to be a, an equal partner from the very beginning of, of preparations of funds. So from the partnership agreements to so preparation of operational program and then through uh, monitoring and evaluation. And uh, I will also mention technical assistance, one important part of operational programs. Um, it, is, it is included normally in all operational programs and it can be used for um, capacity building of civil society organizations, but only those who participate in operational programs. So um, we are also discussing this with the Commission because for the moment it's not used for the capacity building of, of civil society organizations. Uh, I will say something, so I, I gave you a little like a quick overview of how it's set up organized, uh, on the level organization, uh, European structural funds. And um, of course, it's so complex. There are so many things and it, it can go wrong and it went wrong <laughs> in many occasions. And uh, what we are trying also, we are lobbying and advocating is to have like monitoring and a complaint system in place. The commission, yeah, they say there, it is in place and there is a legal framework in a, this common provision regulation. And I put you, you know, I listed some articles here, but you can find many more. The problem is when there is a complaint, if a, a project is, if, if EU money is, is misused, what we detected many times in, in, the, in the past, that instead of investing in a community-based care, it's invested in institutional care. So uh, someone should make a complaint, but it's all complex because at the end, an organization can make a complaint to managing authority, that is a government who is managing the funds. So it is not really impartial. And, uh, and only if it's not sorted out on the level of a country, then the commission can intervene. But now we are, uh, we are trying also, if you detect something, if you have doubts about some projects that are problematic, you can tell us, and then we start, we are already checking, uh, verifying with the Commission, you know, situation. And in order to avoid this violation of human rights, when the, the funds are misused, Commission put in place uh, guidance on ensuring that, uh, that the European, the Charter of Fundamental Rights is, uh, is respected. 
Uh, and uh, it consequences of non-respect of its territory, it, it can be possible interruption of payments, possible suspension, financial corrections, or also infringement. Uh, now, uh, BG Region, uh, the European Commission, they, they, they launched a study on the compliance handling system in member states. I will give you now also a short overview of our campaign. So having said that, you know, the, how the funds are managed, and you know that in, 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 the, in the past, INIL together with other organizations detected many problems, uh, many problems with the use of funds. INIL launched a campaign in November 2016 that is supported by Open Society Foundation's Mental Health Initiative. It's called EU Funds for Our Rights. And the aim is really to encourage European Commission and the member states to improve monitoring and complaint system in order to ensure that the funds are used to protect human rights and not to restrict. So the objective in this first, let's say, period during this year is really to support local and national organizations who are advocating for rights of disabled people and also to raise the awareness about the cases where structural funds are still used in violation of, uh, of the UNCRPD among uh, EU institutions. So. We, are, we have regular um, dialogue with the European Commission, with the uh, NEPs at the European Parliament, and uh, we try also with the member states. And the long-term objective is really, it will propose improvements to the monitoring and complaint system, and, and really, in, in a dialogue with the Commission and the European Parliament and European Ombudsman, to see how, how that can work, how it can be sanctioned if, if the money is misused. Huh? And I already mentioned why the campaign, you know, in a, in a period 2007-2013, we talk about more than 150 million euros that was detected that was used to, to renovate or rebuild new institutions in Bulgaria, Hungary, Latvia, Lithuania, Romania, Slovak Republic, etc. And we, we have some doubts also for the current uh, period. So we try during our activities, providing evidence, raise awareness. We have really like on daily basis discussion and uh, with, the, with the EU officials. We will try to give practical solutions, to build capacities, to build alliances with other NGOs, especially on, on EU level. And we, we have, yeah, the current activities, meetings with NGOs at the EU level, regular meetings with MEPs. We try to include not only MEPs that are, uh, that are in, in a group for disability rights, but also others that are in charge of structural funds, human rights, because it is linked with the human rights issue. And we organize these three regional events in Brussels, Vilnius, and Bucharest. And very similar problems were raised. We had a very good discussion, and I, I believe you would have similar also problems. In, we tried to cover all member states, but at the end we managed to cover in three uh, countries, 18 member states. And what is also important, we tried to also include uh, Western Europe, because we often had examples from uh, Central Eastern Europe of use or misuse of funds. So now we, we have on board also some Western European countries. And we hope that some more countries will be involved. And um, that's, that's it now for my part. If you have any questions, please uh, let me know. Raise your hand. Anyone want anyone has a question? No? No. <laughs> <laughs> Okay.
Okay, so no questions. I think you can still ask later uh, if you think of, but maybe Ines, you can um, take the floor. Yeah. Thanks, Natasha. Now, can you give me the permission so people can see my screen? Um, okay. Okay, you should be able to see my presentation. Yes, we can. Can you not can you confirm that yes. it's on? Yeah. Okay. So, hi everyone. Um, my name is Ines Bulic. Um, I work with um, Natasha at the European Network on Independent Living. Uh, I work as um, policy officer, um, projects manager, uh, and my um, the main areas that I work with are um, the institutionalization and um, um, structural funds and how they can be used to support uh, the institutionalization. Um, so after Natasha's overview of how quick overview of how structural funds work, uh, which I suspect uh, might be a bit confusing if you um, haven't, um, you know, if you haven't worked um, on the use of structural funds before. Um, but after this quick overview, I'm going to give you a little bit of information about how NGOs can. Um, uh, get engaged with structural funds, basically. Uh, what uh, you know? What can you do in your in your own countries? Um, and this is very much based on um, Eno's work in this area, um, which um, has started uh, now um, ten years ago, actually. So we we do have quite a lot of experience um, in um, in monitoring and advocacy around structural funds use for. I'm independent and um, I'm not going to give um, much information about how you can apply for structural funds. So, I mean, I'm not going to give any information on that. Um, it is more really about how to advocate uh, and monitor around structural funds. Um, so, um, as I said, um, in the presentation, I will provide you with sort of an overview of all the different opportunities um, to be in. And it's lost too. You lost me. Yeah, we didn't hear. Anything. Oh, so what is the last part you didn't hear? You heard? <laughs> so, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, sorry about that. It could be um, my um, question. Um, so, did you hear the overview, Natasha? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it was yeah. just a couple of seconds. Okay, okay, so I'm going to continue. Hopefully, um, this is going to work. Um, so, to start with, um, you know, what I, I thought it would be useful to start with the overall um, sort of goal of any um, advocacy or monitoring. So, basically, it is to ensure that structural funds are used to develop quality community based services in the member states as part of broader deinstitutionalization reforms. I mean, here one thing to understand is that, you know, structural funds are not meant to replace state funding. They are meant to, um, you know, they're they are meant to um, support innovation, support reforms. So there's something in addition to state funding, um, and um, it is very important uh, for, you know, the country to basically commit to continuing whatever they started using structural funds to continuing that with state funding. Uh, so that's why I'm saying um, we are looking at um, how structural funds can be used as part of broader reforms because again I mean they they are meant to um, support change basically. Um, 
And the other thing we uh, want to do is to prevent structural funds from being used to either build new institutions, renovate existing institutions, or you know to support any um, other segregating settings. Um, so this is this is um, our sort of um, our goal um, of you know all the work uh, that we do. Uh, one important um, issue as well is it is also very easy for countries not to use structural funds um, for this purpose at all. So they may just choose to use structural funds for something completely uh, different, uh, not in you know not uh, uh, for anything related to disabled people or you know children. Um, so this is also something we don't want. So we do want structural funds to be used, but for a good uh, purpose. Um, and um, my presentation is very much based on the toolkit on the EU funds, which we um, have worked together uh, with the uh, European Expert Group on the transition uh, from institutional to community-based care on. And the toolkit has this nice um, uh, schematic um, sort of presentation, which you can see in front of you. And basically, it's about, it's, it has a lot of information on but it's just to give you a rough idea that um, basically that there are various stages of a structural funds use that can um, be helpful to the process of deinstitutionalization. So uh, we must, it's not as if it's enough to do one thing, you know, before or during the programming period starts. Uh, it is very important to, to follow it through, you know, from the very negotiations um, for the programming period uh, to the to the beginning to implementation um, and you know throughout the monitoring and evaluation and I, I will take you through through these um, different uh, sections now um, so in terms of the, the role uh, NGOs or CSOs can play um, we are looking basically at uh, three main stages um, here where you uh, can uh, make a difference. Um, and that is the programming stage, the implementation stage, and monitoring and evaluation. Um, in the programming stage, Natasha mentioned briefly, there are two uh, important documents. Um, there are the partnership agreements and the operational programs, which set out basically how the country is going to use structural funds. Um, and at this stage, these documents have to be approved by the European Commission. Um, so at this stage, I think the, the influence <coughs> can be um, quite um, big uh, because uh, we can target both the European Commission and the member states. Um, and until these documents are approved, by the Commission, they basically they are not the money cannot be used. Um, after this stage, we come to the implementation stage, uh, where basically um, member states are publishing, uh, putting together and publishing the calls for proposals for different projects, and they are selecting projects to be funded. At this stage, it is very much up to the member states about about how the money is used. Um, and they are not really under the scrutiny of the Commission anymore in most cases. So here um, the, the, the role of the NGOs is, is very important um, because this is where we have to be uh, very um, alert to, to you know, what kind of projects um, are being um, advertised for funding, who is being selected. Um, if we want to prevent uh, money from going in, into um, institutional um, care settings. Um, and um, the other, the last um, sort of stage is the monitoring and evaluation. Uh, this of course runs through um, the previous stage, so it is a continuous activity. Um, and um, here there are uh, two main possibilities and that is for NGOs to be involved in the monitoring committees and also to independently monitor um, how um, funds are used. Um, 
So now after this brief overview, I'm going to take you through each stage really and tell you um, in a bit more detail about uh, what can be done you know, at, this, um, at the different stages. So if we start with the programming, uh, now this happens before the actual uh, funding period starts. So we are now in the 2014 to the 2020 um, financing period and uh, so programming would have been done already before, uh, before 2014 and usually there are some delays but um, theoretically programming should be done before the financing period starts. Um, at this stage um, when it comes to the partnership agreements um, the member state um, has to set out uh, the main problems in the country, so um, you know where um, EU funding is needed, um, you know what are the main sort of gaps. Um, they are meant to set out um, expected results, so what do they think um, the EU funds can help them accomplish. Um, they are meant to um, they are meant to basically demonstrate um, which means that they are meant to show that how they're going to use different funding streams together. So how are they going to use ESF and ERDF together? Uh, they are meant to also explain how they fulfill ex-ante conditionalities. So which strategies do they have in place that um, you know will serve as sort of a background to structural fund spending? Um, and this is, I mean, and all of all of these things um, are, um, all of these um, areas are very important because um, if um, the problem analysis isn't done properly, um, it means that uh, you know perhaps um, they, there aren't um, exact numbers of how many people live in institutions, or they have the country has no idea, you know, who needs services, how many people need services, what kind of people need services. So if this problem analysis isn't done properly, it follows that you know also the funding will not go to the right types of services. Um, expected results again are very important because here we would like there to be much more emphasis on social inclusion rather than simply you know explaining that people will be moved from one place to another. Um, again with, with uh, com combining ESF and ERDF um, here I mean it's important to, to put pressure again on the country to show that okay um, how are we going to use the two strengths, strengths of funding to really you know support the institutionalization and, and to ensure that people um, have access not just to housing but also to mainstream services etc how ESF will be used to train uh, people, uh, you know, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and as Natasha mentioned, the, the strategies that are listed here um, are important because countries, well, they just put any strategy there, and um, you know, assuming nobody will check it, and in a lot of time cases, nobody does check it. Um, so um, if 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 you notice or if you know that the strategy that they um, listed as sort of to show that they're fulfilling ex ante conditionalities isn't a good one, then we can at that point we can still go to the European Commission and ask them to look um, look into it. Um, so this is roughly about the partnership agreement. Um, now the next stage, once the partnership agreement is um, is adopted, uh, it's important to say also that at the stage of partnership agreements, the Commission can ask the member state to um, focus on certain areas. Uh, so in respect of about 10 countries, and these are mostly countries in Central and Eastern Europe, they have asked them to, um, to include the priority of transition from institutional uh, to community-based care into their partnership agreements, which means basically those member states had to um, um, had to include them, had to, you know, uh, plan for uh, using structural funds in this area. Um, in a lot of the countries where the Commission didn't uh, insist on the inclusion of uh, this uh, priority area, 
um, there, there is no mention of the institutionalization in the partnership agreement. So these would mostly be countries like Germany or, or France where, where there were no plans to, or Belgium, no plans to support the institutionalization at all. Um, so then we come to the operational programs. Uh, basically, um, these follow on from partnership agreements. Um, and then they, and they set out uh, in a little bit more detail uh, the different priority areas and what kind of um, actions are going to be supported uh, with structural funds. Um, here again, the countries have to identify the needs uh, for investment. They have to uh, justify why they chose those investment priorities. Um, and importantly, for those countries uh, uh, where deinstitutionalization is one of the priority areas, this would come under the priority axis, promoting social inclusion, combating poverty and any discrimination. They have to indicate, um, you know, list of actions for, for both the ESF and ERDF about how they are going to support uh, the process of transition, uh, what kind of actions um, are they going to fund. Um, usually, uh, the ESF and ERDF would have uh, would be under different operational programs. Um, usually, the ESF would be um, under the operational program of human resources, for example, um, and uh, ERDF um, is, is usually something like uh, regional operational program, something like that, which is focused on infrastructure. Um, so it's important to follow more than one operational program as well to make sure that um, the actions included in the ESF operational program and ERDF operational program complement each other well, uh, both in terms of actions but also in terms of timing, uh, because what happens um, quite often is that they're completely uncoordinated. So for example, you know, uh, infrastructure is meant to be funded first, uh, but uh, nobody knows how to basically move the people into the new infrastructure. There is no staff trained to, to work in these new settings. I mean, often this, these new settings are institutional um, in themselves. So um, it's very important to look at different operational programs. There may be also operational programs, um, for example, an operational program for environment. Uh, where in the past we have seen the renovation of institutions um, inserted under energy efficiency. So you might, you may need to look at, you know, additional operational programs as well. Um, there can be also an operational program on rural um, development, which can contain also some services. Uh, which, you know, may come under the umbrella of sort of transition from institutional to community-based care. Uh, and here again, operational programs are meant to um, set out output and result indicators and the common quality indicators. Here it's very important that these are linked to social inclusion and that they are linked to the CRPD, that they are not just about measuring, you know, how many people were moved, or um, just the physical kind of um, uh, the physical infrastructure, how big something is, etc. How many square meters? Um, <coughs> that it's uh, linked to basically the quality of life, so that you can measure afterwards whether the people who the the institutions, the settings, services that benefited from structural funds, to what extent they contributed to um, improving quality of life, to improving people's access to independent living, to social inclusion, etc. Uh, so all this, um, you know, ha can be set out in the operational program. Um, then the next stage, once the operational programs are approved by the Commission, uh, the country can um, begin with implementation, which basically means that they can start spending the money. Um, I mean, obviously, this is a key area because um, a key stage. Because once the um, the money is spent, you know, there is no there is no going back. Um, so here, um, it's very 
important to look at um, what calls for proposals are coming out. Um, usually there is there is some indication of when <coughs> sorry usually there is some indication of when calls for proposals will come out for different priority areas and areas. Uh, so you can uh, <coughs> so you can uh, you can know when to expect them and then also there may be um, public consultation around the calls for proposals where you obviously um, can intervene. <coughs> Sorry about that. I have a bit of a cold. Um, so um, yeah, this is uh, it, it's it's important to intervene here before the calls for proposals are actually published and before the calls are, before the projects are selected. Once the projects projects are selected, it can be difficult or, or the funding, you know, has, has started, it can be difficult to reverse the process. Um, and I guess the most difficult thing is once the money has been spent, let's say, to build small institutions, uh, again, in the middle of nowhere, let's say, it's, it's basically impossible to, um, to do anything about it other than, you know, to complain. Um, um, so this is this is where we are now at this implementation stage, and um, it's it's important to to be involved. Um, we have some, and this is from the toolkit. We have put together a checklist uh, for the selection of projects. So what you might want to look at. Um, so this is looking at the calls for proposals. So you want to see what the call for proposal says about the process. So how you know who can uh, who is eligible is it uh, the local authority um, are, is partnership with NGOs uh, possible um, you want the information about the target groups um, about the legal and regulatory frame framework um, so um, again because there can be there can be a lot of barriers in the legal and regulatory framework to you know whatever um, is going to be fine if, if community-based services are to be funded and there are um, different barriers in the existing legislation then that's going to be a problem obviously. Um, you want uh, to see what information uh, is provided about the services that are going to funded, be funded, how these services are going to be run, um, by whom, are there any standards, quality standards. Um, you want to see what information is provided about the resources, financial and human. Um, again, because this can influence um, the quality of the service um, uh, as well. If, let's say, personal assistance services are to be funded, which is very good, but you know, how many hours can be funded? What is the funding per hour? So you would want to look at really all the details. Uh, information about user involvement is there any mention of it at all? You know, is there anywhere, uh, any possibility where uh, disability organizations uh, are to be consulted um, in the process and you want to see what the call itself says about monitoring and evaluation. Um, so that is, that is um, at this stage of uh, implementation and the calls for proposals. Then we come to the monitoring um, stage, which is, uh, as I said, it kind of runs through the whole uh, program. Um, the idea here would be for uh, you, if you are interested and if you are, you know, uh, if you have knowledge on um, the process of institutionalization, uh, to be involved in the relevant monitoring committees. Again, each operational program will have, will have its own monitoring committee. I mean, the operational programs are huge, so potentially the list of monitoring committee members is also huge uh, because they cover, you know, all areas, not just disability. Um, so sometimes it is very difficult to get on the monitoring committee, uh, but, um, you know, it's, it certainly is possible and some of um, our partners are involved um, in the monitoring committees. What the monitoring committee should be doing is reviewing progress towards the set objectives and reporting on progress um, achieved. Um, and again, we, we have come up with a checklist for monitoring because again, monitoring can be, can be very tokenistic. 
uh, it can be just you know people ticking boxes uh, but um, that's why we have provided a little bit of a checklist so you can see whether monitoring does work well <coughs> in your country so some questions to be looked at are whether the service users are meaningfully involved uh, whether the focus of the monitoring committees is on the indicators on the progress towards quantified target values milestones defined in the programming um, whether the progress reports include any information about the fulfillment of ex-ante conditionalities um, how are the annual review meetings organized? So these are supposed to take place every year. Uh, is there any involvement of service users in these meetings? Um, how are the recommendations given by the monitoring committees and the commission followed up? And what actions? Um, <clears throat> whether uh, the action is taken by the European Commission if ex-ante conditionalities haven't been fulfilled? and whether the monitoring committee provides an accessible summary of the progress report for the public. Uh, so we as Ina would be interested in hearing how this is working uh, in the different countries um, because this is, this is how the monitoring committee should work and actually this is based on the regulations so it's not, it's not our wish list but it's how the monitoring committees should function. Um, Evaluation, that is um, sort of the last stage. Again, the regulations set out when the evaluation is to take place. <clears throat> so far, we haven't learned <clears throat> a lot from evaluation. I mean, it's very difficult actually for people even to access results of evaluations. But what we would want to know is um, how well they are resourced and do they include independent experts who actually know about the process of the institutionalization uh, about CRPD, etc., so that they can uh, tell to what level uh, the projects funded comply with the CRPD um, and you know promote social inclusion, etc. So uh, again, this is something um, to be looked at. Um, now, so I've given you an overview of the different stages um, in terms of the advocacy targets because I mean this is very much kind of a monitoring and advocacy exercise they go hand in hand um, you you cannot do advocacy without monitoring because you will not have the information you need uh, and if you do uh, monitoring it's important to do advocacy at the same time otherwise nothing will change um, so in terms of advocacy targets at the national level first of all your main point of contact uh, it's going to be the managing authorities. I mean, as Natasha said, they are in charge of how money is used. So there, these will be the different ministries. Um, usually, um, DSF would be under the Ministry of Social Affairs. Uh, ERDF may be under another ministry, like the Ministry for Regional Development, or sometimes the Ministry of, for, uh, of EU Funds. It depends from one country to another. Um, Ministries can often set up different working groups um, looking at uh, in charge of different operational programs, especially at the stage of planning. Uh, the role of the regional and local authorities is very important because they are actually, most of the time, they are the beneficiaries of funding and sometimes they are meant to develop uh, regional and local plans. They can also very successfully block any uh, projects uh, if they, let's say, are not interested in the institutionalization, they can make sure that, um, you know, the funding is not used uh, for that purpose. Um, <clears throat> so they're they're really key key players. Um, also, if you want to find out about how the money is actually spent, uh, you will need to go to the regional local authority local authorities for information on specific projects. Um, and then, um, as mentioned, there are the monitoring committees um, and then you have also members of parliament in your country who can um, also uh, ask for scrutiny of the process, etc. And the different NGO platforms, because um, this is not just of interest to uh, disabled people's organizations, but other organizations as well in the area of environment or, you know, uh, Roma rights, um, other groups. Uh, so some NGO platforms were looking at um, 
budget uh, budget spending and uh, in general um, funding um, may also be there and it's important to sort of target them and get involved. Uh, in terms of the European level, our main targets are the is the European Commission. Um, DG Employment um, is in charge of uh, the European Social Fund and DG Regional Policy or DG Regional is in charge of the European Regional Development Fund. Uh, DG Justice is also important uh, and other, other DGs like DG Agriculture. Um, we have the European Parliament and as Natasha said we are targeting them through our campaign. Again MEPs um, can ask um, the Commission questions uh, about why is the money being used for this or that. Um, they can uh, raise concerns about the different problems, not just with the Commission, but also in the Member States, of course. Um, you have the Petitions Committee. Uh, there's been a petition around the use of structural funds submitted um, in 2009. Uh, the Petitions Committee can organize investigative visits to the country, and it has done so last year in relation to Slovakia. So again, <coughs> complaining to the Petitions Committee is not very quick solution or anything, uh, and not terribly effective, but can be another way to raise awareness. And the European Ombudsman, who's had an inquiry in this area, is another, is another authority uh, which is looking at whether structural funds are used um, in line with the European uh, Charter on Fundamental Rights. Um, and finally, at the international level, there's the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities has issued um, recommendations to a number of countries on the use of structural funds for deinstitutionalization, including through the European Union, asking the European Union to uh, improve the monitoring and complaint system and to make sure that structural funds are not used to support institutions. And then there are other committees like the Committee on the Rights of the Child, which would be looking at, of course, um, specific services for children with disabilities as well. Um, so just to wrap up uh, on, on the timing, uh, and I'm, I'm going to be done soon, I mean it, timing is obviously very important when it comes to structural funds because it tends to follow a certain um, um, vision timeline. It's very, um, we are currently in the middle of the 2014 to 2020 financing period. Uh, but already um, there are discussions about the next programming period, 2021 to 2028, uh, looking at um, you know the, the next um, set of regulations. Uh, so we are make we have to make sure that you know the ex ante conditionalities are kept, and we have to look at what improvements can be made in the regulations to make the system more effective and better able to support, you know, um, the rights of disabled people. Um, and um, as, I, as I said earlier, for the implementation to start in 2021, all the documents like the partnership agreements and the operational programs have to be, um, have to be adopted. So uh, some countries are already starting discussions about, um, you know, looking at drafting the partnership agreement, looking at priorities, etc. So already there might be working groups formed in different member states looking at the next programming period. So you have to, at the same time, you have to follow the current programming period and plan for the next programming period um, in terms of advocacy. And just finally, how can we support your advocacy efforts? Uh, so we, as Natasha mentioned, we have quite um, uh, quite often uh, contact, we are in contact with the European Commission, uh, with the desk officers for different countries. Uh, so uh, we can raise concerns uh, directly with them when uh, we think it would be a more effective solution than going to the managing authority and we usually do because uh, even if the managing authority is doing something it's important they are aware of the problems the member states um, they can also ask the managing authority for more information if the NGO is not able to do so so we can we can help with facilitating communication with the Commission uh, we are also involved in the so-called structure dialogue group of experts on structural funds 
and link to that uh, two thematic networks on social inclusion and partnership. Uh, so here again, there, there are possibilities to raise concerns um, about the different pro problems in the member states when it comes to um, the system of structural funds use. Uh, we are a member of the European Expert Group on the transition from institutional to community-based care. So here again, we have open meetings with the European Commission to discuss problems in structural funds use and also the partnership, <laughs> the implementation of the partnership principle. And as Natasha mentioned, we, we have uh, the campaign as well. Um, just a final point, I mean, for all this to, um, for us to be able to do advocacy at the EU level, we of course need information from the member states about the problems uh, on the ground. Um, so we do encourage, um, you know, organizations active at the local and national level to keep us informed. Uh, and we, we do send out surveys um, now and again about um, um, the questions about potential problems in the member states, which we then um, analyze to compile briefings or reports uh, for the for the Commission uh, and the parliamentarians. Um, so, on a very final note. Um, what you can expect from us next is we are just finalizing a briefing explaining how the monitoring and complaint system works with recommendations to the European Commission. This is an outcome of our you know, three regional events that Natasha mentioned. Um, and we will be including some model letters organizations can use to contact the managing authorities. So this will be available very soon. So you can look out for that on our website. Uh, and finally, Natasha will send you this presentation so you will see a list of some useful resources. Um, and there are many more um, on, on our website actually in relation to structural funds. So that is, that is it. I hope it was uh, useful and um, please, I'm happy to answer any questions. I don't know if I'll be able to see your little hand, but Natasha will. Well, I don't see any hands at the moment. Ah, oh, there is a hand. I was better. Yes, please. Yes. I was better. You raise your hands. Yes, please. Maybe she can write the question in case the sound doesn't work. Yeah. Can you hear us? Or, um... Don't hear anything. It's great. It's then no. It disappeared. We can go to the next next section, Atosh, if somebody has questions. Yeah, maybe if you don't have questions, you go to the next section. It's, it's a bit uh, different when we are live and when we are sitting around the table and uh, when I know in advance how many countries are represented. Now I know more or less according to your names and emails. I know that we have Serbia, Greece, Austria, Sweden, Spain, Bulgaria, Czech Republic or Slovakia, France, Ireland, Poland, Romania, Lithuania, Armenia. But uh, let's start from the beginning, how I, we have the list here. So maybe Alveta, you could start uh, just shortly to present yourself and to cover these questions, if you can, like in two or three minutes, if possible. So we go according to this, you know, list we can see on the dashboard. Ashbeta, can you hear us? Maybe she can hear us, but we can't hear her.
No, we can't hear you. Alzbeta is writing a, a question. No. Uh, we can't hear you. You can't to the microphone? No. You can to the microphone? Can we maybe go to... Ah, I see your question. Um, you're asking uh, if our Arbeta is asking if our campaign and you, our efforts could be extended to candidate countries and EPA programs. Um, well, normally the campaign is uh, campaign is for structural funds, so it is for the member states. But what INIL is doing, you know, in general, INIL also covers. Um, Enlargement countries. I don't know, Ines, if you would like to add also. <laughs> yeah, I just said. Again, I don't hear well. Huh? No? How about now? Better? Oh, better now, maybe. Yeah, okay. Um, so the trophy also covers um, pre accession funding. Um, it, is a, it works differently, uh, obviously, but uh, one, uh, one provision is that um, in terms of policy, um, the pre IPA should not fund anything basically that structural funds wouldn't fund. Uh, so by that extension, uh, IPA should also not be used um, to support any type of institutional care. Um, we have done some work um, around this um, uh, in terms of, um, you know, uh, coming to um, give workshops, etc. Um, and um, so, yes, I mean, we, we, can, we can also support um, some efforts there. Uh, one difficult thing um, is, it's a bit similar as to structural funds, um, is that uh, with uh, enlargement countries, it very much also depends on the Commission's priorities in that country, um, how uh, IPA will be used. So if the institutionalization is not a priority, if you know, it may be ver various other human rights issues that are more important to them, uh, then it is more difficult to um, get the Commission also to push for IPA to be used uh, to function the institutionalization reforms. Um, so yeah, there are opportunities there as well um, for, for advocacy, but it can be difficult depending on the Commission's priorities. I hope that answers your question. Okay. Maybe Maybe we can go to Kathy now. Kathy, can you hear us? Um, okay. Okay, Kathy can only uh, write questions. So um, she asked, she's leading a Rasmus Plus program. and focusing on DI, so she's interested in how much the project can link into 
structural funds projects. Could we share, share each other organization name and area of work interest? Um, well, we could we could we could see that we could discuss it. Uh, I mean, one one thing to mention is that um, structural funds, um, in terms of uh, funding, uh, usually it is the the, the local um, regional authorities that are eligible, you know, to to apply for funding. So it is not uh, necessarily NGOs that would apply for funding. Sometimes it's possible, of course, uh, but these are big. Um, these are very big um, multi-million uh, euro projects. So, um, in terms of uh, it, it, it is it is different than than other EU funding like Erasmus Plus, uh, for example. Uh, but. Um, it is possible. It's important to work with yeah, the local and the regional authorities so that um, they uh, do apply for funding uh, for the institutionalization, that they develop projects, etc. Um, so this this could be a role for NGOs. And yeah, as I mentioned, uh, NGOs can often apply for as partners with the with the authorities, local or regional authorities. Um, to um, support, you know, the institutionalization reform. So this could be another role, but it is a very different um, type of funding from um, Erasmus Plus. Um, one problem also for NGOs is because uh, these are really huge amounts of money that NGOs may lack, uh, you know, administrative capacity to um, uh, to uh, to manage such projects. Also, because um, the uh, whoever um, uh, whoever benefits from the funding has to pre-finance uh, a lot of the costs, uh, the commission will afterwards reimburse uh, reimburse the, the local authority, um, um, etc. So it it can be um, you know unfeasible for NGOs to apply. Okay, I will see if um, the next person, Joanna, can you hear us? Okay. Maybe people are forgetting to unmute their mute button. Yeah, maybe, yeah. Can you unmute? Because we can unmute, but you also need to unmute. Um, Oh, yes, 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 here. Yeah. Okay, Joanna? Thank you. Okay. Yes, Joanna, sign of life. Uh, well, we, we think we will uh, write an email to you, okay? Because we have to, to discuss about it. In which country are you from, sorry? From Poland. Okay. 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 Do you have any questions? Or would, you, would you like to say something about Poland? No, thank you. We will, we will write an email. Okay, okay. Then maybe Juan can also say something. Juan, can you unmute your uh, mic? Juan? I also see that you are sending questions now, so we will reply to the questions and we'll send you in the coming days, uh, if, if that's okay. I mean, if nobody wants to say anything about their country, maybe we could just reply to questions, I'm just thinking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There is then Christina. Christina, you can unmute also, if you want to say something. Maybe you want to say something? I see that unmuted is um, Mirza. Mirza, you want to say something? You want to ask her? Um... Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yes, we can. We, 
we we heard you and then we lost you. Okay. We heard you, huh? Okay, can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, yes. thank you. Okay, thank you. Well, I, I don't have any any special questions, and I didn't I didn't prepare something special for this okay. webinar. I just want to say that uh, in our country, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, we have uh, recently we uh, we have some activities uh, about advocacy to to authorities on uh, federal and uh, state uh, level uh, to 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 make uh, some uh, better better position for uh, organizations and people who works with. Uh, Persons with disabilities, but we don't have a, we don't have a, any any special uh, any special outcomes or uh, any special conclusions uh, because uh, uh, of course our country is in the process of uh, IPA funding or or indeed in, in, you know what I'm what I'm uh, trying to say. Uh, also, we are uh, uh, we are we are established uh, during the during the period of 2014 to, to 2017. We established that uh, we advocated that uh, the institutionalization would be one of nine priorities in the in the process of uh, IPA funding. But uh, recently, in, uh, in the stage of uh, for uh, uh, 2017 uh, and 2018, we are not in the position to 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 uh, to uh, to put the process of the institutionalization in the in the in the uh, process of people founding. So we uh, right now we are trying to 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 uh, to uh, make some connections with the representatives of European Commission in Sarajevo. Uh, to make uh, some kind of a, of a meeting uh, with them, to to speak with them, uh, it, maybe they can uh, maybe they can uh, help us uh, to 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 make some uh, uh, better steps in this in this process. That's it's, that's the only uh, what I'm what I'm going to say. Maybe you have some some questions for me or something like. Some, some kind of yeah, I, I just think because I, I haven't mentioned and obviously at the EU delegations uh, when it comes to uh, um, accession countries are important uh, are important as well so um, yeah in terms of in terms of uh, influencing um, what what is being funded um, and in terms of uh, support with monitoring um, and evaluation I think um, Again, I think it depends on the delegation how much they know about um, the, the the issues um, and um, how you know how supportive they are. But it's good if you have good uh, good links um, in Bosnia. Thanks. Okay, can um, I will go now? I will go to Radosh. You wanna say something or ask? Oh, it took me a while to, to unmute. Okay. No, I was, I was just listening and, uh, you know, no, no comments for now. Just the, the situation is pretty uh, similar in, in like in Bosnia. We are the beneficiaries of in instrument for pre-accession assistance. So I was in particular interested uh, in uh, indicators that, uh, that you've been mentioning. Like, uh, uh, does it stand the same for IPA? Like uh, the quality indicators for uh, using the European structural funds, or well, I think I mean um, to be honest, I'm not sure if the if the rules. I don't think the regulation the the rules for IPA as are as detailed as the ones for uh, structural funds. Mm, they're um, very similar. Yeah, I mean the 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 past. The previous programming period was um, was totally different, uh, and it was really preparing countries for the ESF, and that was well only one actually Croatia, you know. So IPA was really like a copy paste of ESF, but still with a smaller amount, and and it was it was still complex, but not so detailed, you know. But now, 
I don't know what is the, you know, uh, perspective, you know, but IPA is not so copy paste of, of structural funds, but still it is a kind of preparation, you know. Last period it was different because Croatia was joining, so it was really like um, very, very similar, you know, with, a, with, with smaller amounts. But now still it should be, it should help countries, you know, to manage the funds, to be able to learn. But still, it's 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 different, you know. I think I think it's 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 more simple than uh, than uh, structural funds. I think I mean one point I think though is that the commission is very much insisting on you know get on effective use of um, EU funding in general, on kind of value for money and making sure that. Um, you know, looking at basically looking at um, what the results are. Um, I mean, and the, the same goes for the for the European Parliament. So I think uh, if um, you know, if you can demonstrate that um, structural that sorry that EPA projects aren't actually accomplishing anything, you know, that they're being wasted. Um, I think the Commission should be interested in. Um, in hearing that as well as uh, MEPs and then uh, obviously that um, gives us good arguments to ask for better indicators. Uh, yeah, I think it is quite, um, it is quite difficult. A lot of, I think a lot of it uh, does depend on um, sort of good advocacy because also for the structural funds it is only uh, after a lot of work that actually they uh, they are paying it more attention to to results, and there is more talk about um, social inclusion and to what extent do the you know like the ESF to what extent does it facilitate social inclusion? Because a lot of the money was wasted in the previous programming period, and you know we could show how money was used without there being any results in the end, you know. A millions used, I don't know, for training uh, disabled people for employment with no disabled people being employed after that, etc. Um, so, you know, if we can demonstrate that, then again, there's more chance, uh, chances that something will be changed. No, we have a slight, slightly different problem in Serbia, which I find hard to, to put in the con context of uh, misusing the, the, the EU funds, it's actually what's happening now is uh, that uh, the government placed the responsibility on the institutions to transform themselves and they're benefiting of EU money by, uh, by trying to establish like out of institution uh, services like uh, small supported mm -hmm. housing etc. but being also provided by the state-run uh, institution which is not uh, Kind of, I don't know if you can complain that it's uh, that it's misuse, but it's certainly not the quality yeah. which supports independent living as it as it should be. So I don't know if the case can be made to point out that uh, that these funds are misused. So it's the question of model which government is using or imagining to to advance the, the institutionalization. And secondly, uh, some supported housing services uh, provided in the past by by NGOs like for ten years already they fail to be institutionalized and recognized by the state after EU funding has ceased. So, so, so what's happening now is that uh, 20 people, they institutionalized 20, 10 years ago from uh, one institution cl close to Belgrade, they're going to get back to institution like in the following months because the, the city of Belgrade did, uh, decided to, to cut the funding for such service. So, it's yeah, I mean, you have, you have the same problem uh, in relation to structural yeah. funds because, um, you know, with, with the local authorities, um, be, it is often the local authorities who run institutions as well, you know, or central authorities. And um, if there, I mean, it's often, again, institutions, it, it, this is actually the model that is most often used uh, when it comes to structural funds. Uh, as well, that you get either the local authorities running institutions or the institutions themselves are beneficiaries of the funding and they are expected to transform themselves and it's, as you said, then they would provide, you know, uh, they, would, they would develop different sort of supported housing 
uh, options in the community and then the staff that used to work in the big institution would go to work in these um, uh, new settings. Um, yeah, it's we, we are also raising that as a problem, but it is a more difficult argument um, to make uh, to the Commission uh, because at the moment they don't really see it as uh, misuse. Uh, but um, we are trying to, we have done this in relation to Estonia, we really need information about um, how the services are, you know, how the services are provided by this institution. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, how do people live in these new settings? Uh, to what extent um, are they uh, compliant with um, CRPD? Um, so, um, this is how we're trying to to show, um, you know, how many people are living in one a particular setting, etc. Uh, where 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 is it? Is it in the middle of nowhere, etc. Uh, so um, we are trying to look at um, really what what is happening. Um, I mean, how the services are provided, and then to give all these details to the commission. I mean, we have managed to yeah to 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 prevent one project from going forward in, in the Czech Republic, but um, it is quite difficult. Can I just add something uh, before we forget? <laughs> Alzbeta uh, is asking if she could get contacts from the Balkan um, participants. <laughs> Maybe I, I will anyway. I will share emails with everyone if it's okay for everyone. Mm -hmm. you know, because mm -hmm. She works on the Balkans, yes. uh, so it be good. And Mirza, Mirza, can you please uh, tell us from which organization you are? She asked. Uh, from Hope and Homes for ch for Children. Can you hear okay. me? Okay, but anyway, we will we will share your emails. I will send you an email together so that you can see your contact details. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, sure. Um, if if it's okay, can we can we go on um, to hear a bit Theresia from Sweden? Yeah. I don't know. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yes, I'm talking right now. Uh, well, uh, we will apply for an Erasmus uh, Plus program. For uh, it, we have had a lovely project here in Sweden called Assisted ICT for people, young people uh, with uh, cognitive disabilities. They have uh, they have been in a kind of school where everything, the education and so on, was with ICT and it was a special program for them and it was so great and we would like to have uh, a little bit bigger project to hear what the, you are doing in other countries with ICT for this group and then we will have an exchange meeting with the, the, with the young people and then we would like to talk to authorities and so on, see how this could be a kind of a policy in the EU. So that's what we are working for right now. We are not exactly in okay. these e regional funds at the moment, but uh, we are very much interested in what, hap what is happening there also. So that's my and th and thank you for a lovely webinar. Very interesting and useful. Is so we can't, you know, oh, that was me. Sorry. Mm hmm. We can't hear everyone. It's different when it's live, huh? It's discussion <laughs> is uh, well easier mm. and uh, longer. But uh, but anyway, you know, can you also everyone? Can everyone send me? You know, the, or I will ask you also the name of the organization where you are. That I know because I don't have all the. Uh, where I, me and Christina, who is also in, uh, joining this webinar, we are at the county council of a region called Dalarna in Sweden. Okay. Good. So, so we are we are a public body, but okay, we are working yes. together with the non-governmental bodies also. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Can we hear a bit from Vanya? Vanya, can you hear us? Vanya? There may be Vasilis? 
I think Vasilis, you are. Um, Hi. We can hear you, not so well, but. Yes, yeah? can you hear me? No? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, my name is Vasilis. I come from Greece and I work for an NGO called Petagma that does supported living for persons with intellectual disabilities. We do that like the last 15 years in Greece. We have some kind of experience in doing that and we know the situation in Greece, which is not so, so great. And there are many, many people still living in institutions. And uh, I think what you said before, it's like uh, there, is a, there is an urgent need, I think, in Greece at the moment to have a, a very detailed um, image of what is really going on. I mean, how many people are actually living in, in institutions and what kind of institutions and, and how many people are living in, in community-based setting, settings and what kind of community-based settings. I think we need that very much in Greece at the moment. And so it has, that would be great if we, if, if, so, if we could have some funding, some, someone could have some funding in Greece to do so. Um, so that's one thing. And the other thing is about, you said before that, um, about these uh, monitoring committees. Yeah. It's, it, this is interesting as well. I mean, we as an NGO we would, like, would love to, to participate. And uh, I don't know what's the process of. Uh, yeah, it is, it is fixed basically at the beginning of the process. And they decide it's also on the level of the NGO, you know, they, there should be like, because not everyone can participate at the end, you know. So someone should represent NGOs. But that's on one side also NGO responsibility, but also government should a bit look into NGOs that are, you know, uh, active and uh, in, in a concerned field, you know. But then there are very few NGOs that participate. Okay. I think, I mean, uh, I think one, one thing for you could do in preparation for the next programming period is try to establish links with um, with the relevant ministries, you know, who are managing um, ESF and ERDF. You can usually find information online, at least, you know, basic information. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We know uh, so that, that would be that would be one thing. And the other thing I know in, in Greece actually um, there is, um, it's, it's quite a large, I don't know the exact name, but it's like a federation of, or an organization for people with disabilities. They're quite strong in the monitoring yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. So the other route would be to try to, um, you know, make, um, contact them and to see, to find out from them about the work of the monitoring committees and how they can also represent your interests um, in the meantime. Um, but um, I mean if you, yeah, it would be interesting to know how you get on and because a lot of, on paper, a lot of this information should actually be available online, you know, so um, in terms of uh, about, you should be able to find out from the website how, who is on the monitoring committee, etc. It should be quite transparent. So okay. it would be to know what what information is available um, publicly, and you know how how difficult you find it, or how easy you find it to, um, you know, to 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 get some information about the work of the monitoring committees. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you, thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. If there is, if there are no more questions, I will just go a bit quickly through the questions. I'm sorry that it's a bit longer than it meant. I, I will I will check the questions that Kati and Alžbeta maybe you know asked. So, um, but Alžbeta said that uh, they are in the NGO People in Need is a Czech NGO, but they have offices in many countries and they work in Western Balkans. And one of the priorities is the institutionalization and support of community-based services for people with intellectual disabilities. They are very concerned how EPA funds are currently used, and they would like to also to contact uh, the Balkan representatives, as we as you mentioned. So we will anyway share the de uh, contact details, so you can also talk to her, and uh, and as better we can also talk, you know, uh, bilaterally. Kathy mentioned that it's very hard to get the regional government to understand structural funds. 
And she asks if our role is to encourage, uh, well, their NGO role, to encourage local authorities to apply our structural funds. Also know, knowing that Ireland didn't ratify UNCRPG, she doesn't see how Irish government would apply for it. Hmm. I, I, I still... If there are any, if there are any progressive local authorities, you know, some that you have a good relationship with and perhaps, or, or you don't have a relationship, but some who are already providing some good services or funding, um, it's, it's good to encourage them also to apply for, for structural funds. Uh, I don't know how much, uh, because Ireland is a bit more uh, developed, I don't know how much funding uh, it does get for, um, for sort of social, um, uh, social services and uh, whether I don't think, to my knowledge, the institutionalization is not a priority uh, in Ireland in terms of uh, being included in the partnership agreement. So it may be if it's not in the partnership agreement and the operational program, it might be quite difficult to yeah. get local authorities to invest. Well, still, if it's a for the for the future, you know, post 2020, there is a space, you know, to there is a room to, to discuss, you know, with the um, managing authorities, you know. Indeed. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah, and uh, well, Katy and Alveta, well, they asked for the contacts. I will, I will separately ask you from which organizations you come from because this is the information that is missing to us, you don't get it when you register, but uh, it will be very good, you know, that even after this webinar that you tell us, you know, where you come from, what is the organization, and if you, and if you need anything, you know, we can, we can, we can have a bilateral, you know, little meeting on Skype. Uh, I don't know if anyone wants to say or to ask anything. It's on mute. <laughs> um, if there are no more questions, uh, there are no more questions. We would, we would close here, but we will keep you updated on uh, on our campaign on activities. Not only campaign, but also other inel activities. If you're not familiar and uh, and, uh, and you can contact us anytime, you know, if you see something in your countries, if it is uh, also outside of the EU, if, if you see some irregularities and problems with, uh, with the EU funds, but not only with the EU funds, also with national funds, that is also happening. Huh? So, um, I don't know, Ines, if you want to add something. No, not really, just, um, yes, um, to, to, to remind people to keep in touch and that we can support you with um, um, in terms of um, you know uh, helping facilitate meetings um, at the European Commission or um, just being um, you know helping um, support uh, whatever concerns you want to raise um, so we can we are happy to do that um, and uh, yeah just feel free to contact Natasha um, with um, any additional questions and uh, thank you for your participation and I hope it was you found it useful yeah thank you so much it is a bit it is different than having a live meeting but we hope to meet you at some point somewhere in some other <laughs> meetings and I we hope it was useful informative although it was short uh, regional events were longer and uh, it's really different when we could see and talk and lie with people. But we will be in touch. I will send you already tomorrow uh, your contact details and please really contact us anytime. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. bye. Bye.